This is video number 16 about cosmology. And the title of this one is Something Smells Fishy. In Genesis chapter 1, this is going to begin our fifth day of the creation's account, where the seven-day creation story or record begins in chapter 1, verse 3, running through chapter 2, verse 4. And on day 5, it says, And God said, Let the waters bring forth abundantly the moving creature that hath life, and fowl that may fly above the earth in the open firmament of heaven. And God created great whales and every living creature that moveth, which the waters brought forth abundantly after their kind, and every winged fowl after his kind, and God saw that it was good. And God blessed them, saying, Be fruitful and multiply and fill the waters in the seas and let fowl multiply in the earth and in the evening and the morning were the fifth day. Okay, so in the taxonomy of the Bible, uh, the Bible puts fish and birds together. And the fish were told to fill the waters not replenish the waters because it apparently was the first time. So now the reason why I say that something smells fishy is if we continue to study with logic, we might discover that the evolutionary theory is, is <laughs> it should be put in the circus world. Uh, in this um, day five, the Lord reiterates the establishment of the natural law after their kind. That's what he did in the plant kingdom, and now he's doing it in the fish and bird kingdoms, and then he will do it in the animal kingdoms on day six. You see, the evolutionary professors are religious fanatics funded by the state, they could not survive without coercion, deception, and forced monetary funding. In Romans 1 verse 19, it says, Because that which may be known of God is manifest in them, for God showed it unto them. For the invisible things from the creation of the world are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even as eternal power and Godhead, so that they are without excuse." Okay, a simple example of this is if you're taking a hike in a mountain and you find a watch by a tree or on a rock or someplace, what do you, what do you come to conclusion? Do you think that, that that watch got there because billions of years ago nothing exploded and then uh, became something and on that something became a gray mush and then an amoeba came out and then eventually all this stuff and somehow miraculously a watch showed up on that mountain billions and billions of years later or do you with a little common sense and logic and realize oh a watch oh oh what does that tell me? That tells me there was an owner, there was a creator, and there was somebody who made the watch. Okay, an architect, a designer. There's the word I wanted. There was a designer, a creator, and an owner. Now, it could be all three could be the same, or it could be three separate people. You don't have, you don't see these people, but the evidence of these three Designer, creator, owner is the watch. The creation is evidence of the creator. In Romans 1, 21, it says, Because that when they knew God, they glorified him not as God, neither were thankful, but became vain in their imaginations, and their foolish heart was darkened. Professing themselves to be wise, they became fools. So the evolutionary professor gets his title from the Bible. Oh, wow. These people who are infected with bibliophobia get their title from a Bible. Now, in verse 23, it, gives, it records evolution in reverse. Change the glory of the uncorruptible God into an image make like unto corruptible man and to birds and four-footed beasts and creeping things. So if you go in reverse, creeping things, there's the amoeba, 
beast, birds, animals, man, and now these people think they're evolving into godhood. And that's how arrogant they become because then they want to get rid of uh, certain people because they're at the top of the food chain. You see, even at the colleges in the schools, they use Greek letters for their fraternities. Why do they do that? It's because the standard is the Bible, and it says the Greeks seek after wisdom. That's why they do that. Now, what's going to smell fishy is if you just use a little logic and a little bit of science, you'll discover that the evolutionary theory is a religious faith with that man. I don't got that kind of faith, to be honest with you. And so in 1 Corinthians chapter 3, it's going to demonstrate something that God did in Genesis 1. On day 5, he singled out a certain kind of animal called the whale. That one named animal is God mocking evolutionary professors. 1 Corinthians 3.18 says, let no man deceive himself. Yeah, that's what they've done. Now, you have a right to deceive yourself. Hey, have a good time deceiving yourself. If any man among you seemeth to be wise in this world, got a PhD. Well, on the farm, that means post hole digger. Okay, let him become a fool that he may be wise, for the wisdom of this world is foolishness with God. For it is written, he taketh the wise in their own craftiness. And again, the Lord knoweth the thoughts of the wise that they are vain. Okay, he taketh the wise in their own craftiness. So the animal that's singled out in the creation of the birds and the fish is a whale. Now think about that. Okay, billions of years ago, nothing exploded, became something. And eventually on that something, a gray mush evolved. And in that gray mush arose a sexless amoeba. And that sexless amoeba eventually turned into a tadpole or a frog or a whale or something. And then that amoeba walked on land. So a whale learned how to breathe on land and then backslid into the water. How many baby whales drowned until they learned to breathe at the surface of the water. Well, you say survival of the fittest. Okay. Well, here we go. Here's Charles. I've got a two volume set. Charles Darwin, The Origin of the Species. Have you ever read the entire title of The Origin of the Species? I'll read it in a couple minutes here. So I want to ask a couple questions. So the evolutionist you know, the religious professors in the biology department. Uh, okay, why are, they, why are they concerned about the deaths of people with the COVID-19? Come on, the survival fittest. If they're unfit and they can't handle the COVID-19, why? what do they care? Why do evolutionists like Bill Gates develop a vaccine? unless they intend to decrease the population because they're at the top of the food chain. Why are hypocritical evolutionists animal rights activists? If one of these animal rights activists got infested with parasites, do you think that they would kill those little creatures or allow those creatures to live off the host? Why are evolutionists against discrimination and racism. Well, now it's time to read the entire title of Charles Darwin's religious book, The Origin of the Species by Means of Natural Selection or The Preservation of Favored Races in the Struggle for Life. Now, does, does that title sound a little racist to you hypersensitive Americans? Why do evolutionists get upset about discrimination where discrimination reigns in the animal kingdom? Why do evolutionists, 
hypocritical evolution, oppose segregation when birds of a feather flock together. I'm just asking some very simple questions, trying to get folks to think. Now, if we go back to that whale, how did that hick, that ignorant prophet Jeremiah, know that whales give suck to their young? When he wrote in Lamentations chapter 4, verse 3, even the sea monsters draw out the breast and they give suck to their young ones. How did that prophet in Judah know that? Did he do some scuba diving out in the Mediterranean and discover that? Dolphins and whales, you know what they are? They're backslidden evolutionists. They crawled up on land, learned how to breathe, developed feet, claws, and a tail, but then backslid and they had to go back to the fins and the flippers. They evolved backslidden back into the gray mush to a torpedo-shaped body for swimming with the ability to drink seawater to desalinize it. I mean, they had developed a sophisticated sonar system in search for food after they backslid back into the water, dolphins and whales. The poor duckbill platypus has been stuck in a transitional position for millenniums. I would think that duckbill platypus would be a good mascot for any university, you know, because it is confused. It hasn't, it hasn't popped out completely. It lays eggs, okay, and suckles its young. It's got web feet in the front, but clawed feet in the weir, rear. That poor thing. I think that would be a great mascot for any school of higher learning. Wouldn't you think? The hummingbird. The quill is considered stronger for its weight than any structure designed by man. The quill, the flexibility of the wings produce the equivalent of the pitch of a helicopter. The quill continually changes shape in flight. You know, there's a little fishy called a anablep. The eyes of the anablep are divided in half. One half looks above the water and one half looks below the water. And when you talk to, when they joke to each other, when one of them has to get a pair of glasses, they say, hey, four eyes. Or shall they say, hey, eight eyes. How long did it take woodpeckers to overcome headaches and migraines? You know, since the fall of man, animals have been forced to operate under the survival of the fittest or the law of the jungle or in other words violence being a bully that's how animals operate they don't really like it in Romans 8 verse 19 it says for the earnest expectation of the creature waiteth for the manifestation of the sons of God for the creature was made subject to vanity not willingly but by reason of hope who hath subjected the same in hope, because the creature itself also shall be delivered from the bondage of corruption into the glorious liberty of the children of God. For we know that the whole creation groaneth and travaileth in pain together until now. You see, the animals are looking forward to the coming of Christ. That's why in Revelation 5, at the end, all the creatures are going to glorify God right after the rapture. You see, what Genesis 1 on day, uh, verses 20 to 23 reveal on day 5, that God has reiterated the establishment of the natural law after their kind. Male and female propagate the kind or species. All androgynous sodomites and transgenders are fortunate their parents did not solely practice their belief because they would not be in existence. The same is true for all abortionists, proponents of eugenics, and population control folks. 
are very fortunate their parents did not practice their foolishness and wickedness. God established the natural law of bearing after their kind. Rebellion against that law breeds confusion, destruction, violence, and will end in death. 